The book uh, which I'm drawing from, and I'll leave a, a copy of it, uh, you may have one already, and I'll leave you another copy of something that Guy and I have written recently called The Learning Path School, just as a, as a gift, as an act of continuing friendship between uh, my friends here at the Expansive Learning Network and us in London, but my suitcases you can see are bulging already, and they're full of two or three gifts for each group I'm working with, and, I, and I've got eight to go before I get back from New Zealand where I'm heading after this. So we premised the book on a series of what we think of as myths. Um, so if I were, because I've given it away now, so it would be an artificial question to ask you, um, do you think this is true or false? But I'm going to ask you anyway, so sorry about that. Um, uh, uh, and we listed these. Can, can you read them or are they too small to read at the back? Too small. Okay, well, things like intelligent is rational and conscious. Intelligence is an individual, not a social concept. Intelligence is relatively fixed. Educators make use of it, but do not really alter it. Okay? Now, all of these myths, we, we didn't make a single one up. They're things that people say about education. Okay? Not necessarily the whole bunch of them, and not necessarily believing all of them, but they're there, out in the system. So what Guy and I decided we'd try and do is go search around for the science to see whether there was a scientific basis for that assertion. A and we found, we believe, that they're all false. Every... Um, man, woman, jack of them, as one might say. And the answer is that actually, when you, when you look at what most people would understand as intelligence, and I'll give you a, a definition, or I'll help you to see some other people thinking about this in a second, that actually, this is what we're talking about. And every single strand there is expandable or learnable. And that's, if that becomes your day job, as a teacher, as an educator, as a parent, as a grandparent, whatever, then it kind of shifts the discourse, it shifts the conversations that you might be having. Um, a little while back, uh, for our National Leadership College, uh, I argued, and indeed now it's a, a kind of set text in the Middle Leaders program there, that one of the most corrosive of these myths is the notion that intelligence is fixed. And I'm going to highlight this because this is the antidote to expansive education. Now, we're going to need to have a careful discussion about this because clearly we've been arguing about nature and nurture for a very long time. And there are many ways in which my inherited genetic makeup is indeed fixed. I can't, unless I wear heels, do much about my height. Well, the colour of my eyes are probably not unrelated to the colour of various eyes in my background, etc. So there are clearly some things that it would be preposterous and silly to pretend aren't genetically inherited. But Interestingly, as we understand more about the human genome and at the same time more about the neuroscience of the mind, uh, we're discovering that actually it's probably around 75-25 rather than 50-50 or the other way around. So there's much more that we can do something about than stuff that is fixed. So let me start with the, the first two bits of this argument uh, and then we'll pause after that. So the first argument is that intelligence is composite that it's made up of many different facets, and the second argument is that intelligence is expandable. And then we'll pause after that and we'll see uh, where that gets us. So let's take the intelligence is composite idea. Uh, this is not a new idea. The image I've got here is of a jazz group or an orchestra, and I think it's a more fruitful one than uh, a, a, a single fixed entity. So I'm saying that, and I'm not the first, and we're not the first, um, lots of people have said that there are different things, different components, different elements that make up intelligence. Guilford uh, argued that there were hundreds and hundreds of different things, and it was so complicated to understand that it didn't really uh, have legs. Howard Gardner argued that there were seven or maybe eight different kinds of intelligences. How many of you are familiar with Howard Gardner's work? If you are, it's great, it's groundbreaking, it broke the mould. Uh, but of course it has been misinterpreted by many teachers, as Gardner himself says. In fact, he writes about a trip to Australia, and we quote him in the book where he discovered uh, teachers getting terribly excited about things which were nothing to do with multiple intelligence, and terribly excited about creating little wheels and colouring them in and helping young people apparently purport in some pseudo-scientific way to say they were naturalistic or they were good interpersonal learners, with very little evidence to support that. So a lovely idea because it shows the composite nature of intelligence, which I think is indisputable. And we, the teaching professions, flock to it because that's what we intuitively came into education to do, isn't it? To help young people build on and find and uh, develop their multiple talents. So we, we love it. What Guy and I have tried to do is to extract those areas of 
some of the things that Garden has said and some of the things that others have said, that we can see there's some evidence that you can get better at. Okay, that's the critical thing. And Gardner, that wasn't the task he set himself, but certainly he broke the mould. And another part of the States, that wonderful uh, kind of the doyen of American psychologists who's written so wonderfully about both in school and out of school learning, puts it like this. I just wonder whether this resonates for you. So intelligence is the habit of persistently trying to understand things and make them function better. Intelligence is, if you like, the sum of one's habits of mind. Back to my argument about dispositions. Habits of mind would be a really nice phrase too. Habits of mind is a phrase that uh, Art Costa and Ben Kallick took up. Are you familiar with their work? The Institute of Habits of Mind is one of our pioneering members and Guy and I are doing uh, a lot of work with Art Costa at the moment. In fact, uh, ACER have just commissioned us with um, a different publisher in the Northern Hemisphere to write a book about expansive education, which we're nearly finished and which... Uh, uh, the Expansive Learning Network will finish, uh, will, will feature showing uh, how this, uh, this movement is developing uh, over the world. And art is doing the forward for that, which is very nice for us. Um, so what does this mean in practice? What would this look like if it bit you on the nose in a classroom near you? Well, this has kind of been guys in my life work um, in the last decade. And both through the work that he's been doing on building learning power and the work I was leading when I was at the Campaign for Learning, where we created the first ever national research project looking at what was it that this composite orchestra were doing? What was it that made, uh, uh, was the lived experience of developing multiple intelligences, of living and developing a composite world of intelligence? And we've used the letter R because, you know, kind of not terribly originally, they're not the three R's, not the old three R's. Yeah, everybody happy with the three R's? Yeah, reading? Lighting and arithmetic, okay? We weren't very good at remembering things by their first letter, were they? It was a bit torturous even in those days. And I'll tell you in a moment uh, about something that you probably know but may have forgotten, that there was a fourth R. Anybody know what it was? The fourth R was rotting. <laughs> it was. W-R-O-U-G-H-T-I-N-G. If you wrought something, that's an old word for make. Fashion. So a wheelwright or a shipwright is someone what wrought a wheel or a ship. Now I can only think that in the early part of the genteel Victorian period, when grammar schools were flourishing in the United Kingdom, that the gentle folk who were sending their children there to go off and be the professionals of the future, the lawyers and the doctors and, all, and the teachers of the future, didn't fancy having their kids sitting next to those what did the rorting. And that's where I think the academic vocational divide really first raises its pernicious, evil little head. Um, that's an opinion. I said, I tell you when I have opinions. That's an opinion. Um, because we somehow separated that which is uh, to do with the brain and, and the head and that which is to do with the heart and the body. And I'll say more about that when I talk about practical intelligence. So in this little clock face here, at uh, uh, half past 11, we've got resourcefulness. Resourcefulness is, uh, do you have um, a TV program here called uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Okay. What happens when you get stuck? Phone a friend or ask the audience or go 50-50. Okay. Now, those are good resourcefulness strategies, aren't they? I've got a really difficult problem. I need to narrow the odds. I'll go 50-50. Yeah, I've got over here. I'll narrow it down to two. That gives me better odds. Asking the audience is kind of like chatting to your mates out in the school grounds, isn't it? It's talking to your peer group. Or as a professional, it's picking up the phone on a, co a colleague principal and saying, God, it's a really tricky situation, da da da. Any advice? Yeah, it's what we're doing here, isn't it? It's a professional learning community. That's what we do. And phoning a friend, of course, most friends are attached to Google, aren't they? So you're, you're really unleashing the world's knowledge through the internet when you do that. Now, I'm simply using that as an example. Don't think... Although I love Kurt Lewin, often credited as the kind of founder of action research, his lovely phrase, there's nothing so practical as a good theory. It's lovely, isn't it, that? Um, what I'm trying to say here is, this is very practical. This is not some airy-fairy theoretical, well, yeah, it'd be nice if, wouldn't it be nice if intelligent was composite? This is real-world stuff that you can do. 